Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to the talk, Hindsight Bias, a machine learning story. My name is Mayuk Bhawal. I'm a product management director at Salesforce Einstein. And today, I want to talk about some of our challenges building real world machine learning applications in a large scale. And one of the specific challenges that we faced around bias in training data that goes into the machine learning models. So a quick show of hands. How many of you have heard of Einstein? Awesome. How many of you have used Einstein or would like to leverage the Einstein for your business? Excellent. You've come to the right talk. So this session would be slightly different. I won't be making any product pitches here. But I hope by the end of this session, you come to know a little bit more about how Einstein works than you came uh, in the beginning of the session. So let's get started. Our forward-looking statement, I'm hoping that all of you have memorized it by now. But just in case you haven't, I'll summarize it. Don't buy Salesforce stocks just based upon this session, okay? but based upon the products which are already on our website. OK, so really, let's get started. So I want to start with a bold statement here. There is a common assumption that consumer machine learning is the same as enterprise machine learning. And I'm here to tell you that is not true. In fact, there are many different ways you can slice and dice consumer ML from enterprise ML. And one of the dimensions which is specifically relevant for this talk is data the channels through which data is acquired into the machine learning system. Consumer ML deals with known data, whereas enterprise ML deals with unknown data. Very simple, right? What do I really mean by that? So let's take an example of consumer machine learning. When I think about consumer machine learning or a consumer company or a consumer product, Facebook comes to my mind. We have all used Facebook. And the way data is inserted into Facebook, these are mainly user-generated content, or UGC. They're entered through well-defined interfaces, methodically designed, so that the schema of the data is extremely well-known. We know when the data was created, who created the data, in what context, all of which are extremely important information for data scientists to build machine learning models. For instance, you can create a new status right, on Facebook. You can see there's a handful of templates right there. It can be a photo, or a GIF, or an event on a calendar, or it's a poll. Well-defined interfaces. And we know when the data was created, because they have a web interface or a mobile interface. You cannot just go somewhere else and create this data into Facebook. Another example, you can react to someone else's status. How many ways can you react? 100 ways? No. 50? No. 20? No. There are six emoticons through which you can react. Again. Very well-selected, well-defined interface. And similarly, you can also comment on someone else's status. Again, the interface is very well-designed. On the contrast, let's look at enterprise machine learning. There is a wide variety of ways in which data can be entered and very diverse. And can also be a bit boring. I saw, I saw one of the audience was smiling. Yeah, it can be a bit boring, too. So here's an example of a sales lead manually entering data into the Salesforce system. That's one example. Here's an example of a business process or a workflow process where data is automatically generated into the system. There's a set of conditions here. The condition gets triggered, and the records are generated. And this is the extreme example where we allow you to import data from external databases and external systems. At this point, all bets are off. We don't know how the data was created, who created the data, when it was created. It might be of type, a feature of type text, but as much as we know, there can be numbers in it. There can be categorical variables in it. And this creates a lot of nuances and problems in the data. What kind of nuances? Let's look at a few examples. The example one is hindsight bias, also known as data leakage or label leakage in the machine learning community. In this slide, I have a snapshot of the exact same sales lead, one before it was converted to an opportunity, and the one on the right is right at the time of conversion. And each of these fields in the sales lead are supposed to have some predictive power, like name, phone number, location, lead source. And machine learning algorithm is supposed to figure out these predictive signals from these fields 
and based upon that, tell you the likelihood of the lead being converted to an opportunity. If you eyeball these two leads, they look almost the same, except there is this feature called deal value, which always gets filled up with a value when the lead gets converted. And this is a real example. And why that is troublesome? Because when you train your machine learning algorithm with this feature, it would perform real unrealistically well in your research environment because this feature is actually leaking information about the future that the deal is going to convert into the current training data. And it causes label leakage or hindsight bias. I know everything is super simple so far. Everything is crystal clear. So let me demystify what hindsight bias is a little bit more. And I'm going to use an example which is very common in the machine learning community called the Titanic example. So if you don't know, it's, it's a fun, kind of morbid example of the ill-fated Titanic ship. And what data scientists are trying to predict is the likelihood of a passenger on the ship to survive the shipwreck. And the idea is, again, that there are features about the passengers, like the gender, age, and cabin class, which have some predictive signal here, which is indeed true. It turns out women are more likely to survive the crash. Adults are more likely to die, because I think priority was given to younger kids and babies to get onto the lifeboat. And also, higher cabin class passengers have more likely to survive. It's, it's obvious, kind of, because those are more expensive tickets. They were probably given priority to get to the lifeboat. Now, this was used in a very famous Kaggle challenge, which almost everyone knows about. But what many people do not know is the data that was used was a cleaned up, dressed up version. The original data had nuances in it, dirt in it, which was removed for this challenge. And two such problematic features are boat and body. Let me explain what each of those are. If you are a passenger, got onto a lifeboat, you would be assigned a boat number. And if you are a passenger who passed away and your body was recovered, you would be assigned a body number. Now, you don't need machine learning to tell you that if you are assigned a boat number, you survived. And if you have a body number, of course, you are dead. You can do a simple rule-based engine to figure that out. But this information is there, and so the machine learning will just figure out a rule. And this is exactly the same example where boat and body have information about the future, which is leaking into the present. And your machine learning model, if trained on this kind of data, would perform really well in your research environment. That is the four walls of your lab. But with the actual real world data set, it would perform poorly. And in layman terms, I love this example. It's like Marty McFly traveling to the future, getting his hands on the sports almanac, and using that to bet on the games of the present. And since. Time travel is still not a reality. This is a real problem for us. All right. Another example of nuance is field usage changing over time. So on the left, I have the data set during the training time. And on the right, I have the data set during the scoring time. And a fundamental assumption of machine learning is the data that your model is trained on is similar to the data it's scored on. If it's different, all bets are off. In this example, we have features on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we have their fill rates, the number of times the feature was actually filled up versus null. And we see there are two features, refer and mobile, which has statistically different distribution in the training data set versus scoring data set. This is yet another example of dirty data. If you use that in your machine learning algorithms, it's not going to perform well. And the last example I want to talk about is bulk upload by a business workflow. What's happening here? On the x-axis, we have a date time feature called last modified date. And on the y-axis, the percentage of time, uh, the percentage of records which have a positive outcome. This is a binary classification problem, so you need equal number of positive and negative labels. And so here, the ratio is pretty consistent, 40%, except something terrible happened around 1st of September of 2017. A business process updated a bunch of records, and almost all of them have negative labels. If you feed this into your machine learning algorithm, it would think that your last modified date has a superhuman predictive power, which indeed actually, which actually is not true. And therefore, your model would again perform really well in your research environment, but not so well in your production environment. So those are some of the examples of the nuances created out of the data entered through diverse systems into Salesforce. I want to pause here and emphasize an important point. Almost every other day, I hear about another new machine learning algorithm, another new publication, which where they are claiming they were able to beat the, the last accuracy by a fraction of a percentage more. So there are new algorithms being invented every other day almost. However, what I want to tell you guys is the problem is not in the machine learning algorithm. 
the bottleneck is in the data that is being fed into those machine learning algorithms. So no matter how you emphasize, how you like, create new algorithms, it's not going to solve the real world machine learning challenges. So how does Salesforce solve it? There is no silver bullet. We use a combination of math and statistics to solve these challenges. And in the process, we built an automated machine learning library. So let's look at some of the examples or some of the statistical tests that we use. I warn you, this is the most technical part of the session. So the first thing that we do is plain old descriptive analysis. We look at the data, do mean, median, mode, standard deviation to figure out if the features are really accurate. An example is, remember from the Titanic example, age as a feature. So if your min is negative 5, there is a problem with that feature. A person's age cannot be negative 5. So we use this statistical test to figure out that if there is a problem in those features, and if so, we should drop it or fix it. Things get a bit more complicated now. The hindsight bias example that I was talking about can be detected to something called a Pearson correlation. It basically says, what is the association of your input numeric feature with the output label? And if you have an extremely high association, like 0.9 or 0.99, there is hindsight bias. The other thing that it also helps with is, if you have extremely low correlation, like 0, there is no predictive power in your feature. It's just a bunch of noise. So it's also prudent to drop such features, reduce your feature space. Now, Pearson correlation works great for numeric features, but does not work for categorical features. There we use something else, like a Kramer's V, which is a sister uh, measure of chi-square test, for those of you who are familiar with chi-square. Things get slightly more complicated. In certain examples that we have seen, there is a numeric feature. There is no direct high association of that feature with the label. It's all a healthy associ associ association except that there are certain ranges of those numeric values have extremely high association. The way we figure those out is through auto-bucketizing. So we automatically bucketize your numeric feature into ranges and then treat them as categorical variable and use something like a Kramer's V to figure out the problem. If you remember that feature usage changing over time, the drift that's happening, so we look at the training data and scoring data and do something like a J's divergence distance metrics for the feature in the training and the feature in the scoring. So if there is a huge divergence between those two features, then there is a problem in that data as well. We also have a rich Salesforce type hierarchy, which all of you are familiar with. And we can actually leverage that for machine learning. How? The, imagine the example I talked about. You have a text field, but someone has put numeric values in it or categorical values in it. Because we know it's text, we can actually check the cardinality of those features and make sure that they really conform to the type of the data it indeed is. This is specifically true when you're importing data from an external system. And last but not the least, feature lineage. Machine learning is all about transformations. You take a raw feature, transform it to a derived feature, transform it to another derived feature. And some of these problems which we can find in the derived feature level. But we have lineage. We can trace back all the way to the raw feature and figure out what the problem is and drop that feature. So how does that help us? So let me explain what's going on here. So there are two circles here. One on the left are the features detected by the automated machine learning library, which has bias. And one on the right, the smallest circle, is actually one of our experienced data scientists hand tuning and hand crafting and finding those problematic features. Of course, the machine did miss some of the features with the data scientists removed. But it's promising that the machine learning algorithm was able to find way more problematic features and biased features than the data scientist. But that's not even my point. This is for one data set, one customer, one use case. We have thousands of data, data sets, thousands of customers and use cases. So if you have to use a data scientist to hand tune and handcraft, that does not scale. There is not enough data scientists in the world to do all of those things. That's why we invested in automated machine learning. And here are some results. There are three graphs here. The, the blue curve is no automated machine learning being used. The red one is our v0 version. And the orange or the yellow one is the latest and the greatest. And there are th on the x-axis, you see three environments, the train, the holdout, and the evaluate. The train and holdout are used in the research environment, whereas the evaluate is the real-world production data. And what you see is happening with the blue curve close to one AUPR, which is a very high model accuracy in your train and holdout, but it takes a nose dive 
in the real world data set. Whereas in the orange curve, it's more consistent. It's much less of a nosedive. And we repeated the experiment on another metric called AUROC, which also data scientists use a lot. And we see a similar trend, less nosedive. Of course, we haven't solved it completely. There is still a deviation between what you see in your research versus in the production environment. But we took a step forward, and we continue to work on this. So throughout all these measures or statistical tests that we are running, there are some thresholds that we have to really decide on. So in Pearson correlation, there is this threshold called R. And one of the trickiest things that we had to figure out what is the right threshold beyond which a feature is biased versus actually being a true predictor. Is it 0.75? Is it 0.90? Is it 0.9? And that's just one measure and one threshold. We have like various other statistical tests that I talked about. So what is the permutation of threshold that gives you the right value? So we have been experimenting with many different data sets and many different use cases, and that helps us inform this right threshold. And in order to explain and illustrate the complexity of this process, I created this fancy animated GIF. So on the y-axis, you have the objective function that you're trying to optimize. And on the x-axis, you have this thing called configs. A config is a permutation of those thresholds across all of those statistical measures. And what I'm trying to illustrate here is there is no one single config which wins every time. There is a different config which is winning every single time depending upon the customer, their data set, and their use case. So there's a lot that I covered in this talk. So I wanted to summarize some of the key takeaways. First, the bold statement. Consumer machine learning is different from enterprise machine learning. Bias in data has created some kind of a bottleneck. So yeah, go ahead. Excessively optimize on machine learning algorithms or even create new ones. But that's not going to solve the problem. And we use a combination of statistical and mathematical methods to actually figure out where the bias is and fix it. And finally, determining the right threshold is key to distinguishing bias from actually a true predictor. And all of this goodness is actually a part of our automated machine learning library called Transmogrify, which we actually open sourced last month. So if you're a developer and you're interested how it works, so you want to look at the code, please go to Transmogrify. Uh, Google it. It's transmogrif.ai. And you can look into the code yourself. With that, thank you so much. Thanks for joining me. I hope you have a great Dreamforce. And go to the other talks. Have fun. Thank you. <laughs>